First, just a quick review. The different types of forces acting on bone and joint include tension, compression, bending, shear, torsion, and then combination of all five of these. So again, there's five primary types of forces that act on bone. Tension, pulling apart. Compression, loading the bone or the muscle or the tendon from each of the ends. Bending force, such as what might occur if a football player took a helmet to the thigh and the femur was broken. Shear force, such as what might rupture the ACL. Torsional force, such as if the foot was stuck in the ground when cutting. Uh, and then combined loading. Tension would most likely affect the Achilles tendon, for example. Big picture concept that we talked about in class, but that I wanted to review. The tendon stiffness, and therefore the load-bearing capacity, is a function of the tendon's cross-sectional area, how big it is from side to side. You can think of this as like the width of an oak tree trunk. So the thicker the tendon, the more tension or force it's going to be able to withstand before it snaps, before it ruptures. Likewise, the stiffer the tendon, the more stress it will take before it undergoes a change in length. If we look at that stress strain curve, which we talked about in class, we have several different regions on this curve. So we can evaluate all biomaterials within how the material changes or deforms along this stress strain curve. We can, er we can evaluate several areas of the stress strain curve, such as following the elastic region. This is the region of the curve where if the material is stretched, it will return back to its original less resting length. That's in this portion of the curve right here. So the material will stretch, but as a, a stress is applied and it stresses, i.e. it undergoes a change in length, it will return back to its original resting length. When we get to the elastic limit, okay, and as we see there, it's a re return to a original length change with no structural damage. As we pass the, that elastic limit and get into what's called the plastic region, here we're referring to if the material undergoes a stress, a mechanical deformation, and, and undergoes a change in length, a strain, and it gets past this elastic limit and gets into what's called the plastic region, the material might be able to come back to its original resting length part way, but not the whole way. So if a material starts at this resting length, a stress is applied, it undergoes a strain, a change in length. If the force continues to be applied, continues to be applied, it'll get past this elastic limit. And then once it gets into this plastic region, and then if the stress is taken away, it might go undergo a change back to mostly towards its original length, but it won't get all the way there. Think of this like your waistband in your sweatpants or your warm up pants. If you gain a lot of weight, that waistband is going to undergo a permanent change in length. The elastic modulus, as we mentioned in class, although this won't be on the test, refers to the stiffness of the material, the relationship of the amount of stress relative to strain, i.e. the slope of this stress-strain curve. We can also look at other elastic properties, such as the energy that's stored underneath the stress strain curve, what's, re what's referred to as area under the curve. So if I have a rubber band type material and I pull back on that rubber band, like a, a normal rubber band or like a slingshot, I'm imparting an, a stored elastic energy. So if it starts here at the origin of the graph and we, under, uh, and we impart uh, a mechanical energy into the band, we apply a stress and that causes a change in length in the band. That band will stretch, it'll stretch, it'll stretch, it'll stretch. This area underneath the curve is called stored elastic energy. If the material, such as a true rubber band, okay, or if a, if a tendon is very elastic in nature, when that band is released, all of that energy will be returned i.e. none of that energy will be lost to heat or other sources. However, if the band is not totally elastic, if it's what we call visto viscoelastic, or if we're looking at a tendon, and we impart a fair amount of stored elastic energy, so we stretch the band, we stretch the band, we stretch it out, we stretch it out, but on the way back when the band is released, we lose some of that stored elastic energy, that's referred to hysteresis. Hysteresis is the energy lost. 
when a band is stretched and then released. A large part of that depends on how much time is, uh, is taken between when the band is stretched and when it's released. So in other words, if the band is immediately stretched and then released, not much hysteresis will occur, not much energy will be lost. But if the band is stretched and then there's a long period of time before it's released, we'll lose more energy. It's the same reason why when you do a counter movement jump, you wanna undergo a quick squat and then immediately jump up as opposed to squatting and holding for a long period of time. So in this case where hysteresis occurs, the energy that's returned, this area in the blue green shading right here, does not equal the energy, the stored elastic energy that was initially imparted into the band. So hysteresis officially defined is the energy that was initially stored minus the energy returned during the loading, unloading phase. So hysteresis is energy lost. Let's change gears now and look at bone structures. So we have osteoblasts, which are the bone cells that migrate to the surface in response to mechanical loading. Again, a bone is a very um, vascular tissue that responds to loading or, or lack of use, unloading. So the osteoblasts secrete collagen and other proteins to increase the strength of the bone locally in the area where it's getting stressed. Collagen is a protein that's secreted by the osteoblasts, and when it mineralizes, it reinforces the interstitial space, the space between the cells in the cortical bone. So this is how bone gets strengthened. If we look at the composition of the bony tissue itself, it's roughly 70% minerals, i.e. calcium and phosphate, along with collagen, and the other percent is 30% water. So this, is, this structure matches the function. This is what allows bone to act as it does and to support the body weight as it does. So we have two different types of properties we want to look at. We have what are called ductile properties, which give the bone the ability to withstand tensile loading. And this is the collagen. These are some of the proteins that are in the bone. And then we have the brittle properties, which allow it to be very strong in response to with to withstand compressive load. So these are the mineral constituents, such as calcium and phosphate. So again, we have a structure function match. The minerals, calcium and phosphate, give it what's called the brittle properties, which make it strong to withstand compressive loads. And the tensile loads are uh, able to be withstood by bone due to the collagenous protein that's developed in the interstitial spaces. So if we look at bone integrity. So we look at bone integrity. Okay, so bone is a is a very adaptive material and sensitive to either disuse, immobilization, or on the other end of the spectrum, vigorous activity. We're gonna look at what's called Wolf's Law. Wolf's Law basically says that a bone's change in internal architecture matches its response to loading. In other words, there's a spe specific adaptation to impose demand. If the bone is loaded through compressive loads, i.e. structural demands such as weightlifting or even just weight bearing, depending on the individual, then we're gonna get an increase in cross-sectional area. On the other hand, if it's due to injury or fracture, for example, if it's casted or immobilized, then it's gonna atrophy. So the way this happens is through osteoclasts and osteoblasts. So bone deposition, which is the laying down of new bone, occurs through the action of osteoblasts. Blasts build is the easy way to think about it. Whereas bone re resorption or breaking down of bone occurs through the action of osteoclasts. This is just a little two minute video to kind of show these different bone cells in action.
Okay, so you don't need to know all aspects of that video. It's just a neat little animation to kind of give you more insight into osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Let's look at the ways that different forces act along a bone. So we can look at the cortical bone, i.e. the cortex of the bone, and the blue arrows running along the shaft of the bone. And we can look at the trabecular or spongy bone at the top. This is obviously the head of the femur. Here's the head of the femur, and here's the greater trochanter. So what's neat is if we look at the cortical bone, this is very strong as far as the levels of weight bearing or muscle tension it withstand in the longitudinal direction. In other words, if, you th if we think of your femur having to bear your weight, the, uh, the way you stand in an upright anatomical position, gravity is obviously pulling you down and the femur becomes very strong in the longitudinal direction. The cortical bone is what provides a structural support here. If we look at the trabecular, the spongy bone up near the head of the femur. We notice that this doesn't just run in one pattern. It's actually the, the lines along this x-ray run in several different patterns. And the reason for this is that because the hip, obviously the pelvis has to not only move, but also stabilize and absorb forces in three dimensions. Whether it's walking, running, jumping, cutting, whatever, this bone gets loaded in three dimensions and therefore the bony response, the matrix of the way this, the cells get laid down um, mirrors that loading scheme. So we have this scaffolding arrangement where we see that it's adaptive to multidirectional stress. Let's talk about the next concept that's related to bone. It's called the minimal essential strain, MES. Okay, and don't confuse strain here with the way we talked about it before as it related to tendon stiffness. So the middle, minimal essential strain is the amount of load that's needed to cause adaptation. This is roughly one tenth of the force required to fracture the bone. In other words, if it took a thousand pounds of force to fracture the bone, then a hundred pounds of force is what's called the minimal essential strain, the amount that's needed to load it to cause it to grow. This increase in what's called appositional growth or cross-sectional growth is related to both Wolf's Law and the said principle, which are pretty similar. In other words, Wolf law, Wolf's Law says that bone will either respond to use or disuse. If it's loaded, it'll grow, grow cross-sectionally. If it's not loaded, it will, it will atrophy. And the said principle, again, specific adaptation to impose demand, S-A-I-D. Okay? And so what we see is this appositional growth where uh, towards the perimeter, towards the periosteum, we're getting this increase in cross-sectional area if the loading is greater than the minimal essential strain. The catalyst for this would be weight-bearing activities and structural lifts, like heavy squats or deadlifts. Doing three sets of 12 at an incredibly light weight wouldn't provide enough structural catalyst to cause an increase in cross-sectional area. However, for those of you who might work in a physical therapy clinic or be strength and conditioning coaches, doing heavier loads, perhaps closer to 80 to 90% of one rep max for lower reps, that would definitely reach the minimal essential strain to cause an increase in cross-sectional area. What about situations where there's a lack of gravity or where this catalyst is not available? such as for astronauts in space. Well, typical effects of microgravity are loss of bone rigidity, an increase of bending, and a decreased cortical, cortical bone, cross-sectional area. All these things are no problem for the astronaut when they're in space, but as soon as they take the first step back off the space shuttle, they're in trouble, increased risk of injury. So what happens? Well, NASA's developed strength training routines and special hydraulic equipment to provide workouts and axial loading in space. We're just gonna take a quick look at one of these workouts. Again, these are hydraulically based resistance systems. Whole body workouts, compound multi-joint movements. You can see especially that this astronaut is loading the legs to make sure that he maintains at least a reasonable cross-sectional area of the tibia the femur, et cetera. So when he steps off the when he steps off out of space and onto firm ground with normal acceleration due to gravity, that he's not at an increased risk for injury. What about bone demineral demineralization, osteoporosis? So this occurs when bone resorption, i.e., the osteoclastic activity, outweighs or outratios the bone deposition, how much bone is being laid down by the osteoblasts. So we get a, a net decrease in bone mineral density and therefore a decrease in bone stiffness. Bone mineral density being 
the quantity of mineral deposited in a given area of bone. We can see that there's some gender differences in this. So if we look at males versus females, okay, we can see that it's about even up to about age 10. From age 10 to 20, we get an increase in bone mass, i.e. the total mass of skeletal calcium okay, per unit of bone. And it, males maintain this relatively same increase in bone mass compared to their female counterparts until about age 55 or 60, where females get a big drop off due to menopause. So this is, becomes the point where they're at an increased risk for osteoporosis. They get a loss of trabecular integrity and therefore a structural weakness, so that's a problem. Causes are multifactorial in nature, including hormonal factors, nutritional imbalances, lack of calcium, and a lack of exercise, including cyclic loading that's below the minimal essential strain. So what does that mean? Well, since young bone is more responsive to osteogenic stimuli, osteo referring to bone, genic meaning beginning, we need to make sure that we stimulate that bone at a young age and aim to elevate peak bone mass younger in either the male or the female's lifespan through full body weight bearing activities.